Okay, it looks like we have quite a few people already. So without further ado, we're actually gonna start. Um, welcome everybody, I'm Asya Geisberg. Thank you for joining us today for our studio visit with Jasper De Beyer, whose exhibition, The Admiral's Headache is on view at the gallery all the way through May 15th. Directly from his studio in Amsterdam, Jasper will show examples of his paper models and ba background material and explain his ideas, research, and process behind the series. When I first encountered Jasper's work, I couldn't quite place what I was looking at. I saw the work at a photo fair, and yet it resembled linear drawing and was also clearly three-dimensional. The image was of a woman. She was made of paper that looked intentionally awkwardly wrapped. The figure resembled a historical etching transformed into a contemporary handmade non-mechanical process. The end result was a portrait of a native, which I say with quotes, because had, it had an implied historicity in its portrayal. This was not a person, but a portrait of one culture's idea of another. I was transfixed. And now, four shows later, I'm pleased to present Jasper's latest series, The Admiral's Headache. Jasper de Beyer attended the Amsterdam University for the Arts and the University for the Arts Utrecht. He has exhibited widely throughout Europe and the United States. De Beyer has an upcoming retrospective solo exhibition at the Museum Rijkswijk this fall, and is a recipient of the 2020 Agnes van den Brandeler Museum Prize, which includes a 20,000 euro commission. Previous solo exhibitions include the Centre Photographique Rouen, France, Flatline Gallery Amsterdam, the Wiels Museum, the Netherlands, the Hague Museum of Photography, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, the Museum of the Domain in Sittard, the Museum de Halle in Harlem, Gallery Nouvelle Image de Hague, TZR Gallery Kai Bruckner, Dusseldorf, Hamish Morrison Gallery, Berlin, the Empire Project Istanbul, and Studio Darte Canaviello, Milan. De Beyer's work has taken him to residencies at the Centre Photographique in Rouen, France, the Pont Gamal den Helder Residency in Amsterdam, the Wiels Institute in Brussels, the Institute de Buena Vista in Curaçao and Kamiyami AIR in Japan. He is part of a large number of collections, including the Bank of America collection, the Collection Gimenti Museum Den Haag, and the Rabo Art Collection Utrecht. His work has been reviewed by Het Parul, the Woven Tale Press Magazine, Vice Magazine, the New York Observer, Artnet News, and Time Out New York, among numerous others. If audience members have any questions, please write them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we will answer them at the end of the discussion. Thank you. And now I will let Jasper join us from his studio. Okay, so uh, everybody's seeing me full screen at the moment? Perfect. Well, uh, welcome to my studio. Uh, the background you see here is actually half of my studio. Um, so we were thinking about what the best setup will be to show some objects and also tell something interesting about my work. So we have chosen for this format that we can get all the objects that are built for the Admiral's Headache. Uh, I can get them in front and show their actual models and tell a little bit about the context of these models. Um, but first of all, I just uh, want to give a short uh, introduction. Um, my work involves mainly about uh, colonialism and in specific the clash uh, between uh, two civilizations. And when these kind of things happen, they deliver this kind of cultural uh, surplus, which is kind of seeped through our, uh, our society. Uh, for me, it's really important when I find such an isolated event uh, in, in, in imagery to get it all together and put it on, under a glass ball. So first, of all, it's, for me, it's really important to have this whole world uh, controllable under my hands. This is the reason why I always build complete worlds uh, where everything is referenced with each other. So mostly the things you see in my photo series are uh, connected and are kind of part of the same uh, space. So um, let me tell you about uh, Curaçao, where I went in 2017 for uh, a residency. Um, the plan I actually had for this residency um, was a trigger that I saw all these buildings 
in um, in Curaçao. Wait a second. So now you see it's full screen, right? Yeah. This is how Curaçao looks now at this moment. Um, so this building style you see here is, is also a typical Dutch building style. The facades, uh, well, me being from Amsterdam, it was all, always kind of a normal part of my cultural heritage. So when I came across these images from Curaçao, the first thing that, that, that uh, comes into mind, of course, is the, the bright colors. So I was wondering what kind of <clears throat> dynamic is behind this whole system of bright colors. Wait a second. <clears throat> Can you see my shared screen? No, I think you need to. Oh, wait a second, I'm sorry. That's okay. My apologies. Yeah, <clears throat> this is better. So. <clears throat> well, this is Curaçao then. <clears throat> it's a tropical island. It's above uh, Suriname and next to, uh, quite next to uh, Barbados. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so I went there in 2017 with this, this kind of uh, question, this kind of uh, uh, post to, to find out what exactly is going on in this, uh, on this island. So I did some research about uh, the architecture, but also about the whole function of the island. Well, the island itself, it's, it's quite small, there's 160,000 people living there. The Dutch, they took it from the, the English a few centuries ago. And the first thing they tried is uh, build plantations on this island. So they tried with sugar, tobacco, and chocolate. But uh, the ground's way too arid to, to build something over there, to, make, to cultivate it. So at the end, after two or three centuries, they decided to kind of make salt pans and make, this, make money or make profit with, uh, with uh, making of salt. But it's also very, very notorious this place for a big slave market, kind of uh, uh, served the whole uh, Caribbean area. So everything kind of comes together here, like the Dutch culture, slavery, and being in the middle of three different cultures, you know, South American, North American, and European culture. Um, so for me, this is like where everything comes together. Um, the houses you just saw are typical city houses. A house like this, what you see here, is called a land house. It's a bit comparable with uh, the plantation house from uh, houses from the Gallant South. So the, the land owner was living here. As you can see, it's kind of a fortified uh, construction. And around this construction, again, is a big fence, uh, which posts people out. Uh, also, not only attacks from other countries, but also slave revolts, stuff like this. So for me, it was really interesting to see the architecture almost as a kind of a hull or, or a closed front, like a fortress, and the inside being really intimate, like a typical cozy Dutch uh, interior, as the one you can see here. This is actually photographed in one of these houses. Then, and this was very important. I think in the first week when I was there, I went to a museum about the history of Curaçao, uh, which is called Curao Landa. Um, when I came there, um, I noticed like a very small thing in the, in the museum, which was a, a list of 18th century commodities on it. Uh, sugar, tobacco, uh, salt, uh, a few other things. And then it said uh, slaves. So the slaves were taken up in this kind of, uh, profit balance to to find out how much money they could make about uh, on the slaves. So for me, of course, I know a lot about this subject, but to read this on paper that it was so coldly uh, calculated how much profit people can get for this kind of dehumanized the whole idea of using human labor to get something across. So when I saw that, I knew I had to make the whole presentation avoid of any humans. I just wanted to focus on the system, uh, which makes it possible for people to make such a big organization for slavery. So what I wanted to do is uh, when I saw these uh, buildings, they all look a bit the same in a way. They have the same kind of uh, facades, but also 
the ships, they look the same a bit. So I was thinking about translating the whole idea uh, to the idea of an alien invasion, where you always have spaceships, they kind of deploy. And when they deploy, they have this kind of uniform way of putting these parts on different parts of the, of the new discovered planet. And then they kind of deploy themselves. So I wanted to make this kind of uniform system to take over the island. Well, this is one of these examples is what they're building we're going to build on Mars, uh, which is also a complete modular build. <clears throat> so if you look, take a look at one of these facades, it's completely closed and the hatches make it like one tight uh, uh, facade, which I think is beautiful. And it's also typical Dutch uh, heraldic uh, design, which you find a lot in, in Dutch farms. And then I started to, to study the merchant ships from uh, the 18th century. And then I noticed the complete resemblance between the back, the stern of the ship, and the houses themselves. So I, I, I did, I found a kind of a modular resemblance between those two things. And I thought, that, you know, maybe I should build this out and uh, make ships which kind of leave behind one floor. So like with a container ship, uh, first I did some studies on this, see what kind of combinations between houses and ships or hybrid forms we could make. Um, and the thing was then that uh, when I found this out, I wanted to make a, a merchant ship like a container ship. And not only like a container ship, but the stern, the back of the ship has two levels, two, two floor levels or one, and you could take that off and the ship goes back to Holland and they put these levels on the cart, on the little cart, I'll show you later, and bring them to the destination. So I had the whole spaceship idea completely translated to the 18th century alien invasion of the Dutch, um, which for me was like opening up and building a system. I knew I could go straight ahead with this system. And if I do it like extra solid, really, really hard, then uh, it would effect will be dramatic. The way I built everything is uh, designing everything on the computer or by hand, by drawing, uh, photographing or scanning this in the computer, uh, changing the colors, etc. And when you print this sheet out on paper, you can cut it and fold it in the right way. So it becomes one of these floors. As you can see here, it's a box um, and four sides with two these floor sides. And it looks a bit like this. So this is a small version of one of these floors. And this is this this is the ship that I designed. So as you can see, it doesn't look like a normal merchant ship because um, the top two floors and not, not another floor extra uh, can be added on and and taken off with a crane. So I was really happy with this design. Um, so these small floors they a bit look like this. So this is for, for another picture which I'm going to show you later. Wait a second. It's not sharpening up. Yeah. And then I have to ship here as well. Oh, that's perfect. And as you can see in the back of the ship, there is space here to put these containers on. So ship coming in, container getting lifted off, ship going away, container is putting on cart and brought to its destination. So next thing, <laughs> I had to design a crane which kind of uh, works the same way as the ship. So we had, I had to use this kind of 18th century mindset to, to build everything. So I redesigned this crane. This is a modern crane also from Curacao, uh, coincidentally. Uh, so I had to design a simple version to lift the whole floor was off. So I made some sketches in the computer like this one, uh, where I already had a lifting system, but it didn't work uh, quite well. So when I developed a good one, I, this is one of the uh, blueprints you see. So again, I'm printing this out 
um, cutting it out and folding it in the right way. So it becomes a kind of a folding box, so to speak. And this is how that looks. Let me focus on that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a bit more yellow than it used to be because it was in the sun. But as you can see, those two wires over here, they lift up the floor like that. Mm -hmm. And then the car can drive back and forth over the, uh, over the ship. So little by little, I designed more and more uh, working things for this uh, uh, system. Uh, so I started up with this fortress in the computer and see if I can use this fortress idea of uh, like in Thomas the Train, where you can kind of roll the rails or roll the carts uh, in a certain direction. Um, that's when I started designing the whole harbor around these ships. So I'm trying a lot of stuff out. And you can see up in the front here in the middle, you can see two floors stacked on top of each other. And in the back, you can see a ship which is fully loaded with all the levels. This is the blueprint, the design of the harbor. So as you can see straight in the middle, the, the white line you see uh, above the boat, that's the crane I was just showing. And those three uh, white squares, which you see on the, on the left side behind it, are kind of the carts that are filled and driving to their destination. So every time a ship comes in, it kind of parks uh, really, and then taken off with the crane, put it on uh, the carts and drive it away. Another ship comes on, and this, this way you can kind of fill the whole island with these modules that kind of grow in the whole island. Here's also one of those blueprints. Uh, one of these, the, the buildings I wanted to have in those harbors, I needed to want, I wanted them to be really industrial. So I wanted to give them this 19th century industrial look, but then with kind of an 18th century style. So I was looking at pictures of refineries and this kind of industrial things from the 18th century. So I came up with buildings like this. And as you can see here, I also designed all the palm trees, the small buildings which kind of work as uh, these kind of gas houses. So everything is drawn by me, which is see here. And this is kind of how it looks on a, on a small size. And here you can see how one of these houses work. Um, they're very simple folding boxes, as you can see here. Uh, but I did tape up or glue on all these walls, uh, all these uh, hatches separately, as you can see. So once you have a way of building this kind of stuff, you can just go on and on, of course. And here are some of the palm trees. Other way around. So you see how simple everything is made, but the cutting out, I did most by hand, some with a, a cutting machine, um, but it works quite well. Okay, let's go back. Well, everything put together, I uh, build a, a table of two and a half, three meters. I think that's about seven, seven feet or eight feet, something like that. Uh, and placed everything based on the, the, the blueprint I had. So what you see here is kind of the rough version of, uh, of the whole thing. Um, I used aluminum foil here, but in the actual, later on, I put a mirror on the same place to get exactly the right uh, mirroring in the, in the kitchen. Uh, this took me about, I don't know, one and a half, two months to build, uh, which is really a lot of work because everything has to fit, etc. And here you can see a detail of the image I finally produced and, and kind of published. Um, on the left side, you can see one of those uh, units hanging there on the crane. And on the right side, of course, you can see one of those empty ships sailing back uh, to Amsterdam. And this is the whole image. 
So the whole classical reference of these kind of 18th century uh, uh, etchings and engravings were mostly uh, hand colored. I want to have this, this kind of sentiment inside the, inside the architecture. So I'm pretty happy with this picture because it kind of sums up the whole series with uh, the way the system works, but also uh, the character, but it also has a typical uh, Curacao feeling. Everybody who has been to Curacao sees this picture and can kind of pinpoint every edifice that's there uh, and can place it on the island. So it is a reference, but not literally. Um, when I was there and I designed this whole series, it took me uh, two months for research. Um, but um, I didn't have enough time to build everything there. So I did all the designs there and the plans and the sketches, but I had only two months to build like the first uh, thing over there. So I actually started with the galleon itself, not a small one you saw before, but I built like a big uh, six feet version of the same galleon, but then a bit more complicated. The, the kind of things you see in these kind of sea battle um, pictures. So it looks kind of ridiculous in a way because it is a container ship. So the, the back, the stern is really bulky and can, of course can be detached and uh, put on a different place. Um, the, the studio there was so hot that my my melting glue was con constantly melting. So I had to use other glue for this. It's like really obnoxious, obnoxiously hot. Here you can see that I have, this one is ha completely hand drawn. As you can see, uh, with all the hatches going up, it looks like a really extreme uh, a battery of cannons to defend these kind of uh, uh, levels. So it was for me really funny to think about not a, a galleon or a merchant ship, but more like uh, a fortress on, uh, on the water, something like that, which carries these containers. Uh, mostly in, in my images, uh, in a lot of cases, I photograph the foreground and the background uh, on different occasions and I put them together in Photoshop. The reason is that um, with the depth of field you have often in, in photographs, it's hardly impossible to make a photo in one go because there's always something unsharp. So in most cases, it's much wiser to just do, do two separate photos and run together. Here you can see a detail of uh, the ship you just saw. I, here I added the clouds, as you can see, and also these clouds that are uh, in the waves, uh, which look pretty cool. Ship was a lot of work, really a lot of work. And it's standing now exhibited uh, permanently in, uh, in the Curacao Museum. And this is the end result of the ship. So let's talk about these land houses I was uh, mentioning before, because when I drove around the island a little bit more and read more about these land houses, the more estranging the effect of the land house became. As I said before, the idea of this, this confined space or this fortress kind of space as a sentinel for, you know, for the rest looking over the hills or well, every single hill had one of these land houses. You can see some hills uh, there in the, in the, in the far. Uh, and these also had land houses. So they, they kind of were on the, the best uh, strategical place. Um, but which was also really difficult, I think, is that in every facade on the front, on the short side, there is always a little hole in the top of these buildings. And this little hole is used to, for people, for the, the owner to put fire through this hole. If you do this, the, the other land house, if the other hill sees the fire, reads the kind of signal and signal with, through the whole island. So mostly when there was a message, like there was a slave revolt, for instance, they could get this, uh, this message across uh, in a few minutes. So for me, the whole idea of spaceships and then communicating with each other uh, through some kind of language which we don't understand kind of added to the mystery of these, these buildings, these, these these columns, these, these parts. But this is an actual uh, land house of Curacao. The slave huts, they're, they're called Kuruku, um, were not so defended. And they were also outside of the perimeter of, of the terrains of the land houses. 
And as you can see, this is also completely standardized. As you can see, this is one of these slave houses. Um, they're kind of like, how do you say this? Really Spartan. <laughs> In a way, there's no luxury inside. There's nothing, so just a stone bed. So I had to design all that stuff. <laughs> see if you can see this. This is one of these houses on real size. It doesn't get into folk. Yeah, here you go. So yeah, this is quite, so I made like a uh, hundred or 150 of them, something like that. Um, and also one of these floors mm -hmm. oh, okay. with the wheels on it. So this is the small version. So it kind of rolls across the island like this. So I, I had all the components together uh, to make this one big, I didn't want to make one big fortress, but I want to have this idea of all these hills being connected and kind of basically working together as one big battery of, uh, of defense. Okay, let's go back. So first thing I did was making a sketch, as you, as you can see here in the sketch. Um, the middle of the sketch is quite empty. And the slave houses are in this middle of the of the sketch. So whatever happens if they get attacked, the iron gets attacked. The, the, the slave house in the middle are completely undefended, and apparently not important enough to protect. Uh, second of all, I wanted to have this battery, uh, this combination of five batteries in action. So I kind of came up with the idea to make an invisible enemy, uh, an English ship, uh, which is behind. Uh, on the beach, on the water behind the middle fortress. Uh, so this way you could see all the um, fortresses shooting their, uh, their ballistics uh, without ever seeing an actual enemy. And also, of course, the idea that it kind of gets over the slave house. So it's kind of every battle is, is won or lost over the slave houses, which also kind of emphasizes their position. So, as with the refinery, I made a blueprint of the, of the floor plan. I needed to, uh, to build all these houses, land houses. Um, and what you see here is about three and uh, three and a half meters wide, which is about, I think, nine or between nine and 11 feet. Um, so for me, again, this was like an, uh, a starting point for making a model. Well, a lot of people always ask me, why is the model so designed like this? But that's quite simple because the camera will stand below if you look at this from above and the angle of the camera is always like this so what's outside of the angle uh, it's not needed to uh, to build this so in other words what you see above is the beach and what you see below completely is where the camera view point is. Um, well this is one of these land houses uh, there were a lot more work because some of the buildings were really really complicated um, and I also referenced the actual uh, uh, land houses for this. So you can see what I just uh, showed you. Also a bit of for uh, scale reference. And this is the whole model as it was finished without any um, lighting or something like that. So uh, you can also see the, the ratio a little bit here by the tools in the back. Uh, so this was a lot of work as well. So the refinery in this one was really uh, took most of the work uh, here. And here you can see a small um, <clears throat> part of it, and it, everything is actually together here. The slave huts, the cart, which is driving uh, to its new destination, and in the right above, you can see one of the walls of these fortresses. Uh, wait a second. Go back. So one of the biggest fortresses I built is this one. It also has a really cute light. Can you see this okay? Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. You don't see the hardly see the light. You see it in the back of it here. 
But as you can see, if I hold it a little bit more like this, you can see all the details in it. Jasper, is the ground, the ground, is that like a, a digital sketch or like a drawing that you scanned or something? Uh, like it, it's, it's mostly I work when you have these kind of big surfaces. I just make one A4 image or letter size. Um, and then I, I kind of copy this as a pattern. Otherwise, uh, if the model is uh, three meters wide, I will be making a sheet of three meters with all small transition stuff for the houses. I do this by hand, but if it's a big surface like this one, uh, I mostly copy it and kind of mix it up so you get one pattern of taxes. Uh, but what you're copying is your actual drawing. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, like elements from other uh, engravings, uh, etchings, etc. Okay. Let's move on. This is the image uh, as a whole, as you can see here on the, on the right, it has this big uh, fortress. So of course it's really, um, for me, it's really rewarding to do this presentation because everybody can see now how big it is, um, what the context is, how much work it actually took to make it and what, what the difference between the model and a picture means. I mean, the model, is not an autonomous thing. It's just a model which kind of serves its purpose inside uh, the picture. So um, normally I don't show this kind of things, uh, only in studio vision, but now you can see it and now you can understand how much in is inside of these images. That same museum I was, in Kura Holanda, um, <laughs> the second thing I noticed over there but well, there were no portraits of white people there. So it was about the presence of white people. I mean, after all, they were the initiator of the whole uh, slavery uh, uh, narrative, but they did put costumes over there. So as you can see here, this costume is kind of, like, this is kind of a museum setup where they put the hat uh, loosely on this, this pole and use this cloth hanger construction to make it. So, when I saw this, I immediately knew that if I wanted to portray people or make people being part of this series, uh, I could use them as a kind of a harness. So I could use an empty shell uh, or the clothing in this case to portray people. So for me, this has the same connotation of uh, what you see in science fiction film where they found this kind of harness where some soft body is inside. Uh, like in this case, you can, you, can, you can immediately imagine a person inside of it, but it's still a shell, which kind of says more <clears throat> about the protection of the human, uh, which is inside and, and in itself. So this emptiness and also this Matrushka effect, where you have this big spaceship uh, going to a, uh, a big ship going to a smaller pot, this pot going to an even smaller pot, and in the smaller pot, this, this kind of cockpit where uh, people are also inside a suit. So it's layer after layer after layer. So I did some studies and drawings on this idea of this guy with the socks going like this, um, which I really like. Uh, I was, in the beginning, I, I was alone for a lot of, in those four months. And um, mostly it was too hot inside uh, the house. So I just put the mattress outside of the house and was laying in front of the window a lot of time. And also when I saw uh, what I told before about this uh, uh, inventory list with slavery it was kind of hard to, uh, to swallow. So the first few weeks, I really felt as empty as that guy, you know, kind of deflated on my bed. So it also has a slight autobiographical element which you see here. This is maybe hard to see, but this is the actual texture that I designed for the clothing uh, for that guy. You just saw the sketch, the sketch. I will show you later. But the thing is that you print this out uh, on paper and you kind of use the texture as a, uh, as a cutout shape to make sleeves. And uh, in the middle, you, you can see the collar and the socks. Everything is there. If you glue everything together and you make a humanoid out of it, as you can see here, it looks kind of like this. And 
the actual model. Wait a second. Oh, shit. It's this one. So you can get an idea of the size now and the way it works. It's also a big one, as you can see. So this is the end result I had. Okay, wonderful, great. Well, thank you, Jasper. Um, We're not there yet. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, no. Still working on it. So the final one I wanted to show you, oh. the idea with the pots and the harness. I also wanted these kind of small pots, which you also see in uh, science fiction movies. So I needed something which was more, even more confining than fit inside a building. So I found these carriages in, um, in uh, Brazil at a former colony uh, plantation. And they were carried by two slaves. Like this is a very small carriage. So I was thinking this has exactly the same pot feeling uh, that I need. So this is the one I found in Brazil, uh, the original one. And I kind of based my design on, uh, on this one. Then I needed to uh, make this, uh, the clothing of the figure, uh, which was basically the same as the guy you saw lying in bed. So I had to design a dress because I was using a woman. Uh, I had to design the wig, which was really a nightmare because I started like this with the wig. And then you have to cut it out and make these kind of hundreds of curls with the, with the hair. And that you can see here. So yeah, as you can see that the wig has a lot of detail, uh, but also the whole model itself is, uh, well, quite detailed. All the designs you see here, I, I completely made by myself. So they're not copies from anything else. So everything is my design. Amazing. This is one of the detail of the image itself. And it's also really fun to see the difference between the model and the way the image looks because the lighting is really 90% of all the work. You know, if you just light it out flat, it's, it's not gonna uh, rise itself. And here's actually the uh, original picture as I uh, produced it. So also for me, this idea of uh, a space pod and somebody's actually it's supposed to have smoke, I think was even better. Uh, stepping out of the space pod for the first time and, and setting foot on foreign soil, uh, which get it, gets a double meaning right now. Um, so I've basically uh, now, um, wait a second. I basically now covered uh, five of the six images, uh, also for time purposes. Um, and in the beginning, I tried to tell the story as broad as possible to give an insight at the other images on how they kind of fit in the whole uh, story. So um, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you, Jasper. That was fantastic. Um, and again, audience, you can ask questions. I'm just gonna start the conversation with a few questions for Jasper. Um, Obviously, we've had four shows together, so I've seen the whole trajectory of your work. But um, one of the questions that I get a lot, I think, from um, the audience in the course of all your exhibitions is um, they want to know why why is it just the photograph? Why why is there um, why do you feel that the models serve just the purpose of the photograph? Do you consider yourself primarily a photographer, or is just the the photo is the end result of all of this work. Yeah, I think the, the photo is like the kind of the funnel where everything comes together. So for me, the photo is the ultimate representation of what I can see. So first of all, uh, photography kind of frames itself. So for me, 
I could have ultimate control over the world I design. I mean, I design the whole world. So after that, it's up to me to show a, a certain kind of angle. So it's always in the context. Why did I choose this angle? Why did I show this part of the world? If you would isolate this idea and, for instance, show the models at an exhibition, it would have a sculptural value. And then people will look at it as a sculpture and have to approach it as a maker of a sculpture and have people make this jump like, okay, it's a, it's, it's a model. Wow, good. You know, while here with, with photography, you don't see the scale so much. You don't see the way it's built. But if you look at it for a long time, you can kind of see the way it's put together, but it takes a, a, a trained eye to see that. Yeah, but so to come in short, it's just, they are just actors. Uh, actually, they're just actors from my page. It's interesting because in watching your presentations and hearing your language, you you reference and talk about the idea of movie making and both its influence on your thinking, but also I think the the way that you don't want to show what's behind the curtain, that the, the movie is what you want people to see. In other words, the, the final image is kind of like a screenshot of uh, one film still in, in the grand movie narrative of the whole yeah. series. Yeah. And then can, yeah. can you talk about a little bit how um, the work itself, the whole series has kind of its own architecture like within this world that you've created, both kind of literally an, arch an architecture and figuratively? Well, in, in instance of this project, it kind of um, forces yourself uh, to make these kind of rules. So it's more like you find this kind of phenomenon, which is really interesting, like for instance here in Curaçao, and then this kind of uh, hypo hypo hypothesis comes up, like what if, uh -huh -huh. and if I extrapolate this what if question, you get some really extreme results. So if I want to make my own rules, and break them inside the confining of what I want to build, it's automatically already there. So it kind of also dictates the material, it, it dictates the way it's, uh, uh, it's portrayed, and it also dictates the whole language of a photo series. And that's all connected to the content of the research. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's great to see the whole the time arc of all the work that you do and the way that it starts in visiting the place and then the the research and um the making of it the setting up of the photo can you talk a little bit about just in terms of the length of time you devote to that whole process like what proportion goes to what just for people uh, yeah if you, if you take a year it will take uh two or three months to do like really good research and it kind of that research kind of evolves into a sketching phase or a design phase, which mostly take like one or two months as well. So mostly it's five months, which is just connected to design and uh, finding uh, information. And then mostly I start production after that. that. It's not such a rigid system because, you know, you will find out different things when you're building and have to adjust uh, small, small stuff. Um, so, I see a question. What happens with all your sculpture after you've done for the? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's that's like really a hard one because I've made so many models that it's impossible to save them. So most 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 of them I, I throw away. It has like also a practical reason, but also if they are actors in that picture, I don't want them to be actors in another picture. So I sometimes give a present to collectors like one model on the on the terms that they can't like photograph and show these photographs uh, they have a reference but uh, for me these models i don't have enough respect for them to not to throw them away so this one i kept the ones that you see here i kept and i'm gonna keep them for a while but they also are not built to last for 10 years. They just built to last one day when I make the picture. So this is a kind of a downside when you make these kind of models. Yeah, kind of a painful downside, but maybe good. Yeah. Well, yeah, but um, I'm used to it. Otherwise you just keep on crying about all the stuff that you lost, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I, I have more questions for you, but I see we've already got um, a few more questions in the chat. So 
yeah, yeah. Um, see if I can find it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Nahama. Do you want to read some of these out loud for Jasper to answer? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so Diana Jensen asks, "Your work is so interdisciplinary. When you were a student, did you work only in the photo area? Did you have access to sculpture facilities at the time? Did you make models as an art student?" Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, uh, I I never when I uh, did my exam at the academy, art academy, I was not really into photography. I just used it as a reference, and then I built one scale model um, and used this as a reference to make paintings and drawing. And then everybody said, like, yeah, look at that model; it's really good. And I was like <laughs> a little offended. <laughs> Because you know, I was working so hard on that painting, and then they were saying stuff about the model. But then I realized that the whole model making itself, also for myself, creates a world where I can kind of walk around in. So I, I found out that I'm much more happier with making real stuff, so to speak, uh, instead of drawing it. So I kind of left the drawing for what it is and started with the idea of what happens when I frame something and I build it myself. Well, luckily, a few years later, when I started using paper as a building material, I also found out that I can use my drawing skills uh, as well for a project. So everything like sculpture, um, digital media, and drawing and photography, I can all put them in together in this funnel. And for me, this funnel is the photography itself. So photography itself is not so interesting for me, only when it's a reference to, you know, uh, anthropology or history or whatever but art photography is not so much in my uh, in my radar but more you know why is why is a photograph taken is it a testimonial or not so the idea of testimonials uh, is something which i really value in making stuff uh, it's also in this case when i show you that harbor and it's gone the picture is an actual testimony of something which was in my studio uh, which makes it really a moment so this moment refers to photography, but the time you take to make it refers to sculpture, drawing, and, uh, and painting. Mm. Um, I had another question kind of a little bit departing from the how you make things, but um, since it's such a, a delicate topic to take on slavery, colonialism, uh, the European experience of it, of going into a different continent and an island and all of that history. And, and you seem to really be going deeply into that level of research and thinking about it. Um, do, you, do you kind of ever feel that you're trying to keep yourself or some kind of like judgment out of the framework of your thinking? So, or is it like, are you restraining yourself or is it just natural for you to take these very sensitive topics and put them into such a kind of ethereal place? Yeah, oh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, when, I, when I saw that inventory list uh, in Curaçao, I was completely fucked up. I mean, I was really fucked up. So emotionally, when I read about this stuff, I mean, sometimes I really, really have a hard time not thinking um, but also I have to kind of eat it up in a way that I can use also use that emotion because it's also really a feeling like an emotion where you can do nothing with, you know it's kind of like all over the place so for me kind of turning that around and making it palpable and also see if I can find the mechanism behind it mm -hmm. kind of suits me in a way uh, and that's why it's, it's almost therapeutical, but it also implies that I, my stance on colonialism and slavery is for me is such an obvious uh, mm. point of view that that's just my starting point. It's not my ending point to say, yeah, slavery is bad. Yeah, of course it's bad, but what actually happens, you know, and what does it mean if you make the situation more extreme? I and mean, what, what is left of the whole idea? But also just to show the artifice of it, I thought it was really confounding at first that you presented no people in it. And then the people are only shown in their hollow outside with the wigs and, and these outfits that you know are so formal and so distanced for us to observe. 
Exactly. And you really only give us that as the signature of the human. So you yeah. kind of have to focus on it. But I thought like the, the wilted socks and the, the way the paper just kind of doesn't follow the human form. Everything is really undermining the actuality, the power of that colonial person. And yeah. actually the, you know, everything that they did to all the architecture, all the fortifying, you know, all of that commodification and, and, and all you leave is this kind of pampered shell for us to see. And I, I thought that's a very, in a way it's, it's its own statement on your thinking, on your point of view. Yeah. And also, I mean, when you go to Curacao, I mean, those buildings are there, but the people that live there now, the former slaves, I mean, there are white people left there, but I mean, they're tourists most of them. Hmm. So they're kind of living in a world which is built like that, which is modular, and they kind of reinvented uh, the idea of them living there. It's like, you know, you, you're, you're going into somebody else's house, hmm. which is really strange. So they built a whole island, all kinds of places where you live and you cannot even go into the fucking buildings. So after the independence of Curacao, they kind of said like, okay, we accept, we embrace this. Um, and we try to make do with what we have. Mm. So in that way, I mean, uh, this flexibility and also the taking this kind of distance from the idea is also with something which is uh, also in Curacao uh, at play. Mm. Do you think, uh you'll continue in, in your next upcoming series to, to sort of plumb the history and the colonialism, or do you think you'll go somewhere else for a little bit, a breath of fresh air? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, every corner I make, there's always something which um, you kind of, you, when you learn about a certain subject or anything like that, you first meet the imagery of the subject. So even if you want to study a certain subject, you have to take a lot of time to, to study this. Uh, so the first confrontation you actually have is the imagery. So every time I have a new project, I have to kind of process all that imagery and see if I can be, get behind this. And then you take a step back and use this first imagery you had as a tool to kind of force people uh, to look at it in a different way. Not in a moralistic way, but have you ever noticed that everything, you know, is modular in Curacao? So yeah, yeah. Very simple point, but it kind of makes clear the whole history of the slavery behind it. Yeah, I love how it jumps back and forth between the container, something 20th century and the technology to uh, the 19th century industrialization to back to just the facades that start with the 18th century. And, and you've got it yeah. all sometimes in one place and yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting, the, the commentary on technologies, both in the making of it and also in what you're showing us and kind of combining all of these time periods. So, yeah, it's-, it's Yeah, and also, yeah, exactly. You know, what, what I also want to really emphasize here is that I'm working with a certain goal. So when I'm making this project, I want to have something, I want to investigate something and find out if it's true or not. So my criteria, for making a good project are not so much aesthetic, but more like, are they effective? Do they get the story across to me uh, that it works? You know, is this an empty paper world as I wanted it or not? If that criterion meets, uh, meets that criterion, um, then I'm really happy. But if a picture is really beautiful and it kind of doesn't go so as far as I wanted, I'm a lot less content with it. So, mm -hmm. The reason I'm doing this is because when I'm drawing a conclusion, like a scientist, I can use this as a bottom to, uh, in the next project, to kind of uh, uh, refine this idea. So I'm constantly busy, like, with, okay, did it work? Yeah, it worked. So I can use this and that to make it work again. And if people say it's beautiful or it's not beautiful, that's up to them. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm also open to critical things. When people say, yeah, sometimes people say, yeah, it's too slick or too this and too that. Or, and I always go like, yeah, yeah, you're right. It is too slick. But, mm -hmm. you know, I see it as slick. So yeah, that's yeah. me. Yeah, you know? it had to be that way. Yeah, yeah, it has to be that way. So. Yeah. Uh, no, great. Well, thank you so much, Jasper. Um, I think we've, we've reached our time limit and um, 
I don't see any more questions in the chat. So uh, everybody, thank you for joining us. And of course, to Jasper for sharing your process and your studio. Yeah. And to Nahama for Thank organizing anything, everything. And just to remind everybody that Jasper's exhibition is up for two more weeks. And it's also open today until six o'clock. And I think also we've got a link to the viewing room that we uh, built to kind of have additional images of Jasper's work. And that link is in the chat at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to take a further look at Jasper's work. So thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. And have a good day. Bye-bye.